my role, which is um, tied to helping big companies do new things, I get a question really often, which tied in pretty closely with the theme of, of Social Media Week, um, around being closer, and if technology brings us closer, further apart, and all those questions. And this question, which I've been getting more and more lately is, is technology good or bad? Uh, and I, I always find it a it's, a, it's not an irrelevant question, it's actually a highly relevant question, but it's also unfair, because the answer is, well, both, or neither. And then when I try to reframe it, because ultimately it's about, well, do you think humanity is good or bad? Um, people always get a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and the reason is, we, our conversation around technology and humanity always seems to be, what is technology's impact on humanity, and never the kind of more culpable scenario, which is, what is humanity's impact on technology? So I did the very uh, undaunting task of looking through uh, all the historical drivers of technology. And what's fun about this is you can pretty much add whatever you want. The one thing that people tend to agree on is it speeds up over time. Um, and this list, and, and again, it almost doesn't matter what you choose, but I've chosen a random dozen. Uh, you can add anything you want to this list, but loosely, some themes started to emerge, which are, OK, if I have these things, it's gunpowder, it's a light bulb, whatever you think major technology leaps are. When you go back and look at what their purpose is, you have a pretty set of obvious buckets. And almost anything you think of can start to fall in these buckets. So the first ones are survival. So obviously, you know, make, letting us live longer, or survive threats, or in some way extend our lives. Then you have this other big bucket. Um, and this things like you know the steam engine, the spaceship, <laughs> which is about humanity's expansion, truly expanding somewhere else, um, in a in a physical way, but also in a metaphysical way. Lately, again, pretty obvious. You can name a bunch of technologies that broadly would would fall into just humanity's expansion. And then more and more recently, and again, these aren't like three eras by any means, but they definitely over time. Each one starts to get slightly more prominent. And, and the, the latest one has been convenience. In fact, if you go back to the 1950s, where convenience really started this revolution of technology, where I guess suddenly, uh, in America at least, we were uh, rich enough and lazy enough to want to start making life more convenient. And suddenly, that became a major driver of technology. And so you have these three kind of big buckets, and almost anything you think of, you could probably put into one of them, inevitably. There'll be some examples that, that are in more than one, hopefully many of them, and others that maybe don't apply across the board. But the last one to me, convenience, always seemed like it was a little bit different than the others. And I wanted to kind of figure out why. And so I just chose a random category. In this case, it was weather. And I said, OK, let's look at like weather technologies over time. So if you go back all the way to um, you know, a BC era, of just understanding weather. This was about survival back then, right? This was um, the technologies were how do you keep this reptile alive in this environment because it seems to know when storms or dangerous things are coming. Like that was the way we would learn and try to figure out um, hey, maybe we're in danger from uh, those really crazy winds or whatever it was that was primitive at the time. And then you jump to kind of the invention of the weather forecast, which uh, is actually directly tied to expansion, which is the weather forecast was created actually by a little known fact, a guy uh, who was the captain of Darwin's Beagle. Um, and when the electric telegraph um, was this amazing new technology, it was a way to talk to all the ports and then be able to go, oh, there's a storm in this port, it's raining in this port. And then you could actually start to communicate to ships um, before they left some prediction of the weather. Eventually, that made it into the newspaper. And lo and behold, it went from a navigation thing to a convenience thing in the Victorian era. Right? That's pretty interesting. And then cut to um, picking up your iPhone for the first time, which when the iPhone came out, I, this is a, a personal story. I remember feeling like it was magic to be able to pick up a phone. And I was like, oh my god, I clicked the weather button uh, on, the, on the iOS app. And I could see the weather, and it was in the palm of my hand. And I felt like I was living in the future. Like I had that thought, like holding the iPhone, being like, this is it. Um, I still don't have my jet pack, but I'm definitely living in the future that I was promised. Weirdly, though, around, I don't know, maybe 18 or 20 months ago, I was in Singapore. And uh, I was in a hotel room. I'm there on business. And I'm getting ready. And uh, like I do every morning, I'm like, Alexa, what's the weather? She doesn't answer. I'm frustrated. Alexa, what's the weather? Then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I'm in a hotel room. Alexa's not here. Um, you know what? Let me. And then I'm like, oh, my god. I have to walk all the way to the bed, pick up my stupid phone, unlock it, and look up the weather. Like I felt like it was a traumatic inconvenience in my life. 
And so clearly something has changed because that was fucking magical a decade prior and now was the worst thing that ever happened to me uh, in my um, incredibly harsh existence. And so something about like the way this convenience thing works was different. And so as a driver, you feel convenience differently, right? Like so convenience is individualized to you in the way maybe humanity's survival or humanity's expansion is not, so you feel it. It tends to be also tied to your habits, which is something you feel more, right? Like the second a habit is broken or you're inconvenienced, you feel it more and therefore the bar kind of gets higher. And it's very experiential. And when something's experiential, the ceiling for that is infinite. Every day we have new means of creating new experiences. And so what used to be these big leaps when it comes to convenience is now like just what was magic yesterday is friction today. And it feels infinite and it goes on forever. And so something about the way convenience works as a driver is just dramatically different than kind of historically where drivers of technology had been, had been prior to that. Um, and what's interesting about this is there's a lot of money in this. Um, and, and in fact, there's a great quote. So if, if, uh, there's an article written by uh, this man, Tim Wu, and he said, convenience and monopoly seem to be natural bedfellows, which I love, because it just is a perfect summary of basically every Silicon Valley investment over the last 15 years. Uh, but but his, his piece, he wrote an op-ed in, um, I want to say it was the New York Times, and it was called The Tyranny of Convenience. And, and I would recommend it to anyone. It's, uh, it's not a short read, but it's, it's pretty eye-opening. And the point is, convenience, this thing you feel, and is just somehow measurably different on an individualized level, um, leads to big companies uh, at scale. And so, of course, people put money into these things. And so if you start to look at, like, the types of companies that are coming out now, it isn't just that convenience is a different driver than the previous two drivers, but it's modern convenience is very different because, you know, I mentioned like when, when you invent the washing machine, you're reducing your physical labor, right? When you invent your phone, you actually are in reducing your physical labor of having to go and do these things. Those are saving you a, a physical labor uh, type of job. But when you start to look at all these new big companies, Actually, arguably, most of them are reducing your mental labor, your cognitive load. And you could make the argument, sure, Amazon keeps you from having to go to the store, but if you look at anything Amazon does, it is moving upstream so you can go as quickly from thinking it to buying it. Like it is just, I don't have to keep a list. I don't have to keep track of that, cross that off my list. It is, you know, uh, some people, certainly not me, ask questions like, does Google make us dumber? I, I believe the opposite of that, but it definitely reduces your cognitive load. Who knows as many capitals uh, today that they, that they uh, used to have to memorize as kids? You don't. Why do you ever need to memorize a capital of something? It's on the internet now. So that's reducing cognitive load. So as a convenience driver, that is different, right? We're now talking about a new era of convenience inside of what was already a very modern type of technology driver. And when you look at this and you realize there's a lot of money in it, because you might recognize those companies, right? It's reducing the, the, the mental and emotional anguish of staying in touch with people, of expressing your own brand, of what music to listen to. What's most alarming about this driver at, as, as a whole is actually this incredible simplicity of there are only two business models in it. One is subscription services. VCs love subscription services. Everyone should love subscription services because you get to run the uh, credit card over and over again. That's a very modern day thing relative to reducing your cognitive load. We'll handle all those problems for you, but we're gonna have to take a, an ongoing fee, not a single transactional fee. That is a fundamentally powerful business model today that actually the re reduction of cognitive load has, has opened up. And then the other one, is a little something called advertising, which uh, I'm sure many people in this room work in. Um, I don't know about everyone else here. I've been blown away by the reaction to uh, all of the recent um, Facebook news, right? Which is, and, and I actually feel guilty about it because I'm going, wait, other people didn't know this is what happened? Like really, it was like this, wait, uh, I, I, and I have this thought at like every cocktail conversation I'm in, I'm going like, oh my God, am I somehow, yeah, I have nothing to do with this, but I, because I was aware of it, I feel like maybe I should have talked about it more. And it is, you, you just start to realize like, well, that's just the advertising business model. Um, and so if you look at those two business models and really they are fundamental of modern day convenience, you can actually directly attribute, it, attribute many of the things that people bring up to me when they say technology is bad. And those things look like things called fake news. Well, guess what? Because the business model prioritizes quantity over quality. Is that bad or good? It's a business model. Once you build incentives, guess what? Technology immediately follows those incentives. It's really straightforward. 
The other thing is data breaches. What I think a lot of people don't understand about the internet is it's actually built for distributed information. Fundamentally, the internet is not a place where information should be hoarded. It is the opposite of that. It is built for information to be distributed. The reason information is hoarded is because it is very good for companies in these two business models to provide you a personalized service, personalized advertising, personalized subscription services, and as a result, they hoard your data. And when they hoard your data and other people realize how valuable data is, they go and try to get it. Just fundamentally, that is what the two business models lead to. And then the third, which is, again, comes up a lot. I have a five-year-old, and screen time is all anyone in Brooklyn wants to talk about with me. And the idea of screen time is this interest. It always brings up this, like, well, technology and you know, device addiction, and all those are very real concerns. Are these things good or bad? I don't know. I do know, though, why they happen, which is both of those business models lead to designs that get you to engage over and over again. Fundamentally, they need that. And so you know, one of the worst kept secrets in the world is Instagram's uh, notifications around your likes. They're personalized to you. You don't get those in real time. You get those based on how they know you are most likely to continue to check to see if you got likes. Your experience with that is different than mine. That is good design. Someone should hire that person. Uh, but ultimately, you go, oh, well, that's device addiction. Yeah. That person's also following exactly the incentive we built in the first place, because we only have two business models in this driver. So there's a lot of money in this. We know that. What's challenging is when you look at those other ones that we talked about, of if expansion was a driver, and it still is today, and survival was a driver, and again, it still is today, money is just a different thing in many ways. Somehow, like the, the stakes are different, and as a result, a lot of the mechanics are different. But the thing is, money isn't convenience. We talked about convenience leads to a lot of money, but convenience is much broader than money. And there's a lot of things that are convenient that people didn't monetize. And so I decided to just take a look at this myself. Um, and so I looked at just what happens when people make really convenient things and they weren't in it for the money. The first example I thought of, which I think is uh, relevant because, first of all, it's money, um, is blockchain, right? So you could argue that, well, and I'm set, uh, clearly, I hope everyone is hearing the distinction in blockchain versus Bitcoin or any crypto. But the reality is blockchain is arguably the most underrated, yes, I did say underrated, uh, innovation of our era, which is it actually fundamentally changes a lot of things. And if you were to believe the white paper that Satoshi put out or whoever Satoshi may be, it's about survival. It is presented as, hey, we can't trust banks. We can't trust governments. We need a way to be able to, in a distributed way, um, engage with one another and identify each other and find trust without, without intermediaries. And so, you know, if I don't think, yes, inevitably that person is very, very rich as a result of Bitcoin, but also you, they released blockchain or he released blockchain. And that is a, con a dramatic convenience technology that isn't necessarily tied to money. It's convenience and it's survival if you're to believe the white paper. Um, I'm short on time, so I'll be quick on these. The next one is a little something called the World Wide Web. When Tim Berners-Lee uh, invented it, it really was, hey, the internet is a thing, hypertext is this emerging thing, and he worked at CERN, a, a particle accelerator, and his point was, I have to keep logging into different computers, and each one has a different software, and how ridiculous is it that I can't just it's so inconvenient for me to not be able to share this information, when actually, I think that we can merge a few technologies and make this thing called the web. Uh, it's free. Tim Berners-Lee didn't make any money off of the invention of the web. In fact, there is a promised lifetime free usage of the World Wide Web protocols as a result of this. That is a convenience play, but also an expansion play. If you read anything ever released, and you know, uh, as the head of the World Wide Web Foundation, it really is about expansion. And so you start to go, OK, well, think people are making things around convenience, but there seems to be these other drivers that are still present if you're not focused on money. And that's interesting. Um, because of time, I'm going to be a little bit quick on, on GAN. Um, is anyone familiar with GAN AI, or this, this form of machine learning? So a GAN is basically, uh, it stands for Generative Adversarial Network. So picture you know, um, two neural networks competing with one another. And the way this works is what you're looking at there is one neural network figuring out how to make celebrity faces. Those aren't real celebrities. It is basically one, one of the bots is able to discriminate to say that is or is not a celebrity. And then the other bot keeps generating them to learn to figure out what looks like a celebrity. Right? And so the problem with most machine learning is it tends to not help creative fields. 
but this is intended explicitly to help creative fields, which is how do you make machines creative? They make things. It learns by having a discriminating network against it. That's GAN AI. It's pretty, it's pretty powerful and amazing. It's an op anyone can set this up. Most people working in machine learning have some form of GAN working on creative convenience. Again, not necessarily about money, but highly convenient in a creative field, and also potentially one of these other uh, drivers around expansion, because actually the use cases for this are infinite. It is how you make up patient data when you don't have access to it to invent medicines. It's how uh, a car can teach itself to drive without ever actually going out on the road. Like it's all the drivers together, but not any money alone when it's invented. And so if you look at convenience beyond money and survival and expansion, when you look at them together, we have these huge technology leaps that feel very different than when you're just focused on money. And as a disproportionate number of convenience technologies come out, you can start to feel how maybe some of the reason we bring up is technology bad is, I think maybe we just set up incentive systems with way too oversimplified structures that push them forward. That's why sometimes it feels bad. But again, it isn't technology, it's us. And so if I had any advice to humanity, and whoever has good advice for humanity, it would be, well, if you care about tech, you work in technology, which is probable if you're in this room, and you're worried about, well, what's my role in this, like in the way that certainly more and more people have become aware of recently, I'd argue, well, if you care about technology, maybe don't start with convenience. Start with one other driver and convenience together. And you can still make money. But how do you make it broader than that? And if you just break it into those buckets, survival, expansion, and convenience, um, you may be able to actually put, put a dent in something. And so in the same way, there was this incredibly oversimplified question of, is technology um, good or bad? I would say, well, the answer to that is even more simple, which is the more drivers you have, the more good you can do with it. And so a question I get a lot at, at conferences is, uh, well, first of all, is always, uh, can I have a job? No. But the other question is, well, what should I do then? Like, hey, I, I, I have a career path, and it's already a thing, and it's tied to advertising, or it's tied to subscription models, or whatever it is, and, and where do I start? And I was like, that's a really good and fair question I've gotten. And the, the answer to that, and I looked around, I was like, actually, it's pretty obvious. Like, if I had to name a frontier, and I'm, what, what do I know about anything? I would say, smart cities is exactly the three things we just talked about. If you are today going, I know I want to work in technology, but I'm worried about my impact on positive or negative uh, impact of that technology on, on society, I would say, well, smart cities might be that new frontier for us. Because really, if you look at it, um, if convenience is individualized habit and experience, you can have a job doing all of those things in smart cities. But ultimately, smart cities is about survival. It really is, um, you know, as, the, as we deal with overpopulation and other things. And it's certainly about expansion. Because at the end of the day, smart cities are going to actually set the foundation for how we think about, not joking, colonizing other planets. It's fundamental to the learning we're talking about. And so it really is all those things. And so if you're looking for a job in tech to do good, I would point at like a really obvious place where there's a lot of money and a lot of jobs where no matter what you do, you can probably find a way to benefit it. And with that, I'll say thanks. I appreciate the time. <laughs>